This is Johnny Gould's Jewish State. I want to tell you one thing, Johnny. This is a war Israel didn't ask for. This is a war Israel didn't want. This is a war Israel didn't wage. So, I believe the real pressure should be put on Hamas to lay down its arms, release the hostages, and end the war. Officials in Hamas, they said, we are eligible to repeat October 7th, October 10th, October 11th, October 1000. They said it live on TV. So how can you trust these people? And of course, in their charter, even the watered-down charter that they said we had in 2017, still calls for eliminating the Jews. And they are really a big burden on uh, on the Arab neighbors. Mu'ay al-Sharif has been on quite a journey. Growing up in Saudi Arabia, brought up a religious Muslim, he was exposed to anti-Semitic schooling about Israel and the Jews. Jews are the fierce enemies of the Arabs, and you shouldn't have them as friends. Christians too, but first Jews. Le'e was part of a generation of young Saudis who stood no chance. Isolated from the world, taught to hate. It still goes on, although less so. But the poisoning of his young mind was challenged when he visited France with the Accord School, a home stay program in Paris, so he could learn French. He was housed with a Jewish family. Initially, he refused preferring to be with a Tunisian Arab family, but in the end, he stayed with the Jewish family. His host, Rachel of Yemeni tradition said, stay with us a couple more days and so began a journey to conciliation. But it started with confusion. These people are nothing like what he'd been told. Rachel was a good person. Were the Quranic texts about Jews wrong? Le'e was told at 15, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was a book brought in from Egypt as a text that the Jews don't want you to read. Two weeks, two Shabbats, and Rochelle took him kosher shopping. Le'e was included in Pesach and Hanukkah celebrations, and it was his first-hand education in Judaism. He went home eventually and told his mum, and mum said, I'll give you two months, you'll come to your senses. Fourteen years on, it was the catalyst to a whole new world. Le'e travels it as an ambassador of his country of residence, the United Arab Emirates, and for Muslims. And mum supports his stance on social media, even if she remains a conservative. Le'e studied at Penn State University in the United States, and he loves building motherboards, Putting computers together, he has an exceptional mind, hoovering up knowledge and putting the pieces together as he goes. His English is a constant learning curve. He tweets in Ivrit as a fluent speaker. He quotes the Torah and Tanakh. He wants to pursue a PhD in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a pleasure to have spent hours and hours in Loe's company. And in Abu Dhabi, he took time to show me the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque, the breathtaking foundation building of the United Arab Emirates. All of this made possible by the signing of the Abraham Accords. And we talked candidly with the tape both on and off. I tried to get my head around the tribal differences between the Arabs. It gives me a headache, especially when he says even the Qataris want Israel to win the war in Gaza. Don't they fund them, I inquire? Yes, but there's nothing left to fund now. I ask him about the UAE's support for the South African case against Israel in the International Court of Justice, welcoming the decision for Israel to halt violations and the importance of achieving the two-state solution, whatever that is, with an independent Palestinian state. He says, it's lip service. There's a significant Palestinian population in the UAE, in Sharjah. Sharjah is where the Emirates media is. Enjoy this conversation here in London with Lo'e Al-Sharif. Lo'e Al-Sharif. It's, it's really great to see you. Likewise, Lee. And you are a man of promises. You said in our last TV interview, you said, I'll see you in the studio in London. You were telling the truth. 
I am. I, I'm always here. <laughs> so it's good to be here. Now the weather is really amazing. We, we don't have that weather in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> you don't have that weather. I can tell you that when we, when I was there with you in November in Abu Dhabi, it was the height of an English summer. <laughs> um, believe me, it was uh, it was an unusual November day for yours truly. And welcome to London. Thank you. So um, much. Tell me, what is your venture here? Why are you here? Well, I have um, a long mission to promote peace, um, and I believe it's one of my goals now in life to uh, to make sure that the Abraham Accords uh, not only survive but develops while we go. And um, I truly believe in the uh, in the noble mission of, um, of peace between Arabs and Israelis rehabilitation of relations between Muslims and Jews and uh, I'm here in London to meet a um, few people to uh, to help me really uh, strengthen my voice and make me reach more and more audience um, I believe the message that uh, I'm doing and many of the uh, pro-peace activists in the Arab world are doing is noble and we need to have our voice amplified and I hope uh, that uh, uh, I accomplished this in this visit and next visits as well. I'm going to come to London more often. This is great news. Thank you. After October the 7th, your mission is redoubled. Mm. Indeed. Tell me everything is cool between the UAE and Israel, between Muslims with a vision and Jews. I'll tell you uh, something that would maybe... Uh... Uh, since comfort to you, the advisor to the uh, to the president of the UAE, his name is Anwar Gargash. He's the advisor, special advisor to the president of the UAE, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. May God bless him. He said that when we made the Abrahamic uh, uh, Accords, it was a strategic decision, and strategic decisions are long term. So I'm seeing that the Abraham Accords are not affected um, by the uh, by the war that is now happening, but it would require more efforts, more efforts to uh, to develop the accords. To underwrite them. Exactly. So more efforts, not bad news for us, because we would put these efforts, uh, whether a war happened or not. But uh, it's becoming also more challenging because now our mission uh, requires some sort of, you know, convictions and change of convictions to the masses, especially those who don't believe that Arabs and Israelis should live together or that Israelis are not indigenous to this, to the land of Israel or stuff like that. And, and uh, it's challenging, but uh, we're doing our best and uh, it's, it's a mission worth uh, living for. In our last discussion in Abu Dhabi, you said, we're a Bedouin people. We follow the leader. Mm. And it occurred to me that in a top-down society such as that, the winning hearts and minds on the street, like you said, can be problematic. So that uh, in the ruling class, so to speak, of the UAE, everyone is sold in. But it's the people down the social scale that need to be convinced of what's in this for me. No, I I would say that the uh, the people of the UAE, even socially, they they follow the um, the leader and they trust the leader who is Sheikh Mohammed, may God bless him. But it's very challenging for so many when they watch the news and see all the things that are happening right now in Gaza and stuff. They would find it very predicament, you know, the the predicament of of balancing the scale between what's happening and what do I really think about uh, what's uh, what how the innocent Palestinians are suffering because of this. And unfortunately, the media is biased. It doesn't tell in the Arab world that this all started because of the attack, the heinous attacks by Hamas on October 7th. So everyone now thinks that Israel woke up one day and decided to, you know what, to uh, unleash its anger on the Gazans uh, for no reason. Some people even deny that the rapes and the murders of October 7th really happened. So this is a challenge, but... People deep down trust the leadership. They trust the decision of the uh, of the um, of the president, and it's just it's, it's just a, a, a challenge of conviction when it comes to media because the media is biased, unfortunately. Yeah. And indeed, it is over here. And uh... ah, so imagine what it what what it would be. 
back home. You'd be surprised at how biased it can be here. Mm. And there are now pockets of media here which are different from each other, which I suppose is a strike for pluralism and good things, but nevertheless it is creating hives of division, Hmm. which is very sad to experience in the UK. Very sad indeed. As far as the commercial relationships between the UAE and Israel is concerned, the Abraham Accords just was the starting gun. Mm -hmm. And relationships built. I spoke to our crowd, John Medved, about the relationship between the Israelis and the UAE, the Emiratis. For now... Almost all of those relationships are on hold, aren't they? But they're postponed. They're not cancelled. No, nothing is cancelled. But some projects are postponed due to to the war. And um, um, like the number of flights is minimized. Some flights are cancelled till further notice. Al-Ad is still flying. Emirates is still flying to Israel. But not as regular as it was before October 7th. Now, these things are temporary. Temporary measures to uh, to accommodate with the situation and with the war and everything. Plus, you have lots of people who uh, were skeptical in the beginning, and now they are even more skeptical. It will take time. Time will heal. But, you know, when things sorted out, when this war ends, ends the right way, ends in a way that October 7th is not repeated, ends in a way that the Gazans would, would rule themselves and would... Uh, would eventually have an eternal peace with Israel without getting into details because I don't have the answer to the details. I don't have the answer. Would it be a two state, one state? Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that, I'm sure that, and that's a personal opinion to be honest, Johnny. Speaking of two state now, in, in a way that would, that would be necessary to end the war would be a gift to Hamas. So it would be a gift to Hamas and to those who think, but even, even though Hamas doesn't believe in, it, in the two state solution, I believe that the two-state solution was the optimal solution in 2000. I believe the last opportunity for the two-state solution was the opportunity of uh, uh, Ehud Barak and Bill Clinton and Yasser Arafat in 2000. It was much better than the one in 2008 with Olmert, even with the land swaps. Because you think that there is land swaps in 2008 when Ehud Olmert offered lots of... Uh, but. 2008 was three years after 2005. 2005, in summer of 2005, Israel unilaterally withdrew from Gaza. If you achieved something like a two-state in 2000, you would give the Palestinians something to to cheer them up, to make them feel that they made a true victory, that Israel is withdrawing because of a real peace. But when the unilateral withdrawal took place in 2005, even if they would agree to the 2008 plan of, of Olmert, it would already, you know, this this spice of, of withdrawing would be taken away. So this is why I always say that, my humble opinion, the two-state solution, the true opportunity for the two-state solution was in 2000, when Yehud Barak, Bill Clinton, and Yasser Arafat, and unfortunately the Palestinians failed it. And it's not my say. It's the say of Prince Bandar bin Sultan, the former ambassador of Saudi Arabia to the United States. To the United States, he said that the Palestinians failed this negotiation. And that was, in my opinion, the last opportunity for a a successful two-state solution. And now October the 7th has done grievous damage to the Palestinian cause. However, we thank God for the Abraham Accords and the timeliness of it and the opportunity of rebuilding Gaza which comes from the Gulf, which comes from the UAE, Bahrain, and indeed the tantalizing prospect of a normalization, Saudi Arabia. Custodian of the two hormones. The custodian of the two Custodian of the two hormones, yes, exactly. I'm very optimistic, but when this war ends, now uh, the right way to end this war, I believe it's in the hands of Hamas. If they lay down their arms, release all the hostages, the war would end not today, but would end at this moment. And if Israel doesn't end the war, we would all protest against Israel and say, you should end the war now. But Israel, I want to tell you one thing, Johnny. This is a war Israel didn't ask for. This is a war Israel didn't want. This is a war Israel didn't wage. So I believe the real pressure should be put on Hamas to lay down its arms, release the hostages and end the war. 
But of course, if Hamas, and of course, not only if Hamas, Hamas does have a plan to remain in power, to repeat October 7th. It's not my say. It's the say of the uh, officials in Hamas. They said we are eligible to repeat October 7th, October 10th, October 11th, October 1000. They said it live on TV. So how can you trust these people? And of course, in their charter, even the watered down charter that they said we had in 2017, still calls for eliminating the Jews. So you cannot really trust these people. And they are really a big burden on uh, on the Arab neighbors. The Egyptian um, foreign minister made a, a great statement when he said that Hamas is outside the Palestinian consensus. And that's true. And uh, I believe that Hamas doesn't represent the uh, the aspirations of the Palestinians because the Palestinians need to know that any authority that would represent their aspirations has to recognize fully recognize the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state. Hamas will never accept uh, Israel and their right to exist. And indeed, the Palestinian Authority are saying the same thing. They're also not to be trusted. We have a front from the United Nations, UNRWA, which is a sort of de facto supporter of Hamas, prolonging the war. Even if the hostages are released... The war must continue because Hamas would nominally be in power. The problem with the last conflict between Israel and Hamas was that effectively Hamas won because rockets still were fired into Israel on the last day of that conflict. But when I talked about the conditions, I, I, uh, I didn't say only release the hostages and lay down its arms. Hamas has to lay down its arms. Hamas has to know that it cannot longer uh, govern Gaza. The world will not accept it. And for UNRWA, you know, it's really, you know, what really uh, astonishes me, Johnny, is that in 1948, there were, there were one million Arab refugees and one million Jewish refugees. In 1967, zero uh, Jewish refugees, and still you have more Arab refugees. The UNRWA is established in a way to keep the refugees refugees. But why there are no Jewish refugees now? Because Jews move on. I believe many of the refugees and many of the, I'm sorry, not the refugees, many of the um, administrations or many of the organizations like UNRWA should know that they have to have some sort of a timeline to, to end the status of these refugees. Move on, move on. So, uh, and honor well the reports that are, that were released recently of the uh, uh, of how honor is implicit in the attacks of October seventh are really horrifying. I do understand now, uh, for example, when the UAE and other Arab states still fund the honor well because they say that or they deep down believe that there is no other way to support the those innocents, not the not the one implicated in the attacks those innocents who are still sponsored by honor why if you cut if you cut the uh, the financial aid they would be harmed and they would and there would be an insult added to the injury in a times of hardship to the palestinians and the south of gaza so I, I don't understand that but i know that deep down everyone knows that there is there's a big question mark on honor why. and if you read the statements very well that came out of saudi arabia and the uae there was a call to investigate these claims and I believe if, if an honest investigation would run on UNRWA, they will find out that UNRWA is implicated in October 7 attacks. And they need disbanding because, as you say, even if they serve a purpose for vulnerable Palestinians who are not involved in war, the whole fact of the matter is that they are... I believe they will the be. Top. I believe they, they need I disbanding. I believe don't they? they will be disbanded. Yeah, they need it. Don't I believe they? they will be disbanded. And now, the idea that interests are served amongst the Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia, in rebuilding Gaza, but rebuilding Gaza in a way that emboldens a Palestinian authority with a small with a small a not the current one, that is willing to negotiate and recognize Israel and create 
meaningful uh, neighbourly relations and push back on the Islamist threat within Palestinian society. That's actually the goal, isn't it? There is, that is achievable, isn't it? That really is. It's there, isn't it, Lo'e? Hold on. That is the goal, yes. Achievable, I don't know. You because, don't know. Because I was very uh, worried by the by the statement that was released lately by the Palestinian, the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, his name is Mahmoud Ashtiya. He said, we can form alliance with Hamas. The world needs to forget October 7th. That is a horrible statement, stupid statement. That's the... Uh, and prolongs the war. Yeah, and prolongs the war. So I would say stupid statement. So I don't believe the current Palestinian Authority with its current shape that cannot really control any single part of the West Bank can add value to peace. They cannot even go to Jenin. Why Israel is why Israel is sacrificing its military to go into Jenin camp? Because the Palestine, the PA cannot. So there has to be a Palestinian Authority that would that would uh, be up to peace. And the current one, in my personal humble opinion, is not. So there is no effective or decent leadership within Palestinian society. And there is quite significant support among the street in the Palestinian world for a leadership which is actually driving them to poverty how can we turn this around, Loe? How can fair-minded, decent Arab brothers and sisters the do Palest that? The Palestinians have to listen to their Arabs and sisters, to their Arab uh, brothers, and the Palestinians have to know that uh, they are prolonging the the conflict. Really, not the Arab states. So, in order not to prolong the conflict, let's have a leadership that believes in peace with Israel in the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish state in their ancestral homeland. You know, Johnny, I always say those who who oppose Zionism, they don't understand the meaning of Zionism. Zionism can be explained in one in one line. The right of the Jewish people of self-determination in their ancestral homeland. That's the Zionism. So as long as you don't as long as you dream of annihilating, even if you dream secretly annihilating the Jews or Israelis, throwing Israel off the map, you would never have a genuine uh, uh, authority or a genuine uh, peace partner in the Palestinians. I know these might sound like harsh words, but I'm just saying what, what I really believe in because I, 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 can, I can say that I'm an expert in these relations and I know exactly how these people think. Even those who tend to be very, how to say this, very open, they deep down throw statements here and there, statements that would imply that they would want Israel to be annihilated. Not going to happen. They just can dream about it, but it's not going to happen. The psyche of uh, the Islamist is that Israel is dislodgeable. The history points to that. Um, <laughs> it does. And this is... You know, this is the return after, you know, thousands of years of exile. The country appears strong, but it is only 1948 to now. It's a young country. 75 years old. 75 years young. 3,000 years, years old. 3,000 years old. And to those Islamists who say, name me a one uh, president of Israel before 1948, I would tell them that there was a king. 3,000 years ago, named David, even the Quran recognizes him. Do not embarrass yourself. Do not embarrass Islam. Please. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amin. Amin. As Ed Hussein taught me <laughs> Amin. in this very room. <laughs> the UAE and Israel, Saudi and Israel, Bahrain and Israel, Morocco and Israel share a common enemy. But the order of our enemies are different. So, for example, is it fair to say that Muslim Brotherhood is the... And radical Islamists. Yeah, radical Islamism is the biggest threat to the kingdoms of the Gulf, whereas Iran stroke Hamas, currently and maybe Hezbollah, is the biggest around. And so the order of our enemies is different. Yes. But your audience needs to know one thing. There is a model of Islam that is very successful. It's the model of the UAE. 
It's the model of of moderate Islam, of uh, a prosperous Islam, of an Islam that would stand against extreme, that is tolerant to all religions except for extremism. And this is why Muslim Brotherhoods and Islamists really hate the UAE, because they cannot deny it's a very successful model. But at the same time, it doesn't run the way they want it. The way they want it is chaos, is, is, chaos. is chaos and chaotic way of, of organizing things. And I believe, believe me, if these people come to power, they would first slaughter their opponents and then they will slaughter each other because they are different when it comes to sects and when it comes to school thoughts. Oh my God, it's, it's, uh, it's really horrible. So they should never come to power. And this is why the UAE strenuously uh, stands, uh, stands against uh, Islamism and, uh, and Muslim brotherhoods. And this is the right way, to be very honest. Because the model that they want to bring to our countries is a devastating model. And that is the uh, message that I got from my wonderful trip to the UAE, that it is the hope for the Gulf Arab world, because you are originally from Saudi Arabia. You're very happy to live in the UAE. My other friend, not my other friend, my many friends, another of my big friends, Amjad Taha, uh, he's from Bahrain and comes to the UAE. Amjad is, uh, is by the way, let me tell you this, Amjad is one of the uh, outspoken, true outspoken heroes of peace who was not frightened by the intimidation of Islamists or radicals in the region. So uh, may the likes of Amjad uh, be hundreds, inshallah. Amen. And yourself, Louis. Inshallah, inshallah. It is my privilege and honor to just have a tape rolling and sit down with you and actually have a proper thank you, John. deep discussion. Louis Al-Sharif, thank you very much. And let's have some lunch. Thank you, Johnny. Let's do it. <laughs> There's a lot of competing attention for you, I do know. You're probably consuming more media than ever before to be right up to speed with what's going on in Israel and back home. I'm playing my part in the best way I can, using my journalistic and production skills to make the case for Israel via this, Johnny Gould's Jewish State, and I've done it since 2018. If you enjoy my podcast, and you'd rather it existed than not, that I kept doing it, you can support me very simply by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Johnny Gould because it really helps. Tell your friends, subscribe now if you haven't already, scroll back and look through the 120 previous episodes. And as always, thank you for listening. Johnny Gould's Jewish State is brought to you with Dangor Education.